good morning everybody, this is Matt Reisinger with Reisinger Homes. Welcome to my video blog dedicated to building science and fine craftsmanship. I'm in front of a house that my company has just started the demo on prior to a remodel. Um, this house was built in the 50s and this is a whole house remodel my project my company is doing um, with Dick Clark Architecture here in Austin, Texas. We're in Northwest Hills of Austin. The purpose of my video today is to talk about reservoir claddings. That's a fancy word for a cladding that actually holds or retains water. Um, a typical reservoir cladding in Austin is either brick or stone. Those are two claddings that hold a lot of water. And because those claddings hold water, there's really some special things that I need to do as a builder to make sure that that water is able to get out of that cladding in a, in a, uh, uh, in a fashion that's not going to hurt my buildings. Traditionally, when you're doing brick or stone, we're doing an air space behind those and we're doing some weep holes at the bottom so that there's a little bit of uh, a way for that water to exit, but that's not always done. And in fact, most of the time when we remodel houses, we, houses, we find that there are quite a few problems from water behind stone and brick areas. So this house behind me, um, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't get this video before the stone was taken down, so I'll lace in a photo of what the house looked like. But basically, we had stone in this entire front, the stone on the left hand side there where you see that black sheathing, um, that's original stone from the 50s. And then if you pan over to the right there, you can see there's some OSB there. That was clad in new stone to try and match the old stone. This is a remodel that was done maybe five or six years ago. And on the garage, we haven't taken that stone off yet, but that stone is, uh, uh, again, probably five or six years ago when they did some remodeling work. Let's go over and show you some of the damage uh, that was done from water intrusion behind there. There's two types of, uh, of water damage that can occur from reservoir claddings. There's liquid water or bulk water, and there's also a phenomenon called vapor drive. And um, we're not in a super rainy climate here in Austin. We get about 30 some inches a year annually. But one of the things that we have problems with a lot in our houses is from irrigation. Um, houses get sprinkled a lot and that irrigation can cause severe damage over time. And I have a feeling some of this damage that we're seeing here wasn't from rain necessarily, although the house um, did not have gutters in the front. So at rain events, certainly this, uh, this stone was getting wet. I think a lot of this damage was probably from sprinklers though. You know, people will water their lawns and their shrub, bread, shrub beds on the outside of the house maybe three times a week. Those sprinklers might go off at four or five in the morning and be complete um, with their watering before anyone wakes up. And the house may get a wetting, let's say three or four times a week where that sprinkler is just pounding the house, going right on the brick or the stone or the siding or whatever it happens to be. In this case with the reservoir cladding with stone, when that stone got wet and that mortar got wet, it would soak that water up. Probably tens of gallons of water could be held in there. I wouldn't be surprised if a stone facade on this house could hold 40 or 50 gallons of water. And uh, it might look dry from the outside. The, the surface of the stone would be dry. But that mortar and the stone itself and certainly brick could soak that water up. And that whole front could be quite soaked. And then what happens is the sun will come out and hit that. And that's when we have issues with vapor drive, where that, uh, that water is going to get hot, the vapor, the water, the liquid water is going to turn to vapor, and because of that sun hitting it, it's going to try and drive that moisture into the house. And that's really where some, some big problems occur. This house had gypsum sheathing on the outside. You don't see that a whole lot in uh, residential houses too much anymore. But if you look, there's, there's a bunch of uh, holes in this gypsum sheathing. That's actually where termites uh, were coming in and were eating quite a bit of the sheathing. Um, that paper face on that sheathing was, was getting a lot of termite damage. And we'll step through this cavity here. I'll show you a little bit of the termite damage on the inside. Um, particularly concentrated in this area, you can see all this, all this kind of muddy areas here. Those are termite tunnels. And this, this bottom plate is quite rotted. These two by four walls uh, have quite a bit of rot and termite damage. All throughout this, you can see it actually quite a bit heavier on this back side. See these kind of, these kind of uh, funky uh, tunnel shapes on here? Those are termites eating that, uh, that paper. In general, termites want to eat uh, cellulose products, and they want to eat the most broken down form of cellulose first. So paper is the most broken down. And then once they're done with that paper, or they've gotten what they want to out of that paper, then we'll, they'll go to OSB or plywoods, and then they'll go to two by four studs. You can see that, that termite tunnel, this, this stud was getting a pretty good chomping 
uh, from termite damage. Not unusual to see in a house of this vintage. And really, if that reservoir cladding was getting wet, it was easily transferring through this. And that moisture in that, in that wood was probably a big thing that those termites were, uh, were, were excited about. And that was drawing those termites into the house. Houses that are totally dry and have uh, no sources of moisture are typically not having termite infestation. Let's do a quick test. And I'm gonna see, uh, I'm gonna see if I can visibly show you how fast uh, a reservoir cladding will have liquid water out the backside. So we cut a hole in the backside of the sheathing in the garage. Follow me over here. Um, the new parts of the house were sheathed in oriented strand board, OSB. Let's walk out the front so you can see it. And then in front of that OSB, um, they clad it in stone. Of course, OSB is a, uh, is a more broken down form of cellulose. You can see some good rot and uh, mold forming right there in that door where they where they forgot their flashings. But um, you know, I'm, I actually prefer plywood over OSB uh, for sheathing whenever we can. But let's come over here. I, I've exposed the section of the stone. So we've got a stone face on the outside of this garage. This was done. This masonry was done probably five years ago. They did use a Tyvek home wrap on the outside of that. And so what I've done is I've exposed the backside of that stone. And I'm gonna set up a hose on this backside here, and we're gonna hose this. And my theory is that if I set my watch and start uh, hosing the backside of that stone, is that within probably two minutes, we're gonna see liquid water come out the backside of that. I'm basically simulating what a rain event would do um, with splashback off the roof, or what sprinklers would do to a house. So let's cut the video. Let me get the hose going, and we'll be back in a second. Nope. Yep, there it goes. You hear me? What's that? Yeah. You see? Yep. Oh yeah, look at that. Popping right out. Yeah, so here we go. We we filmed for uh, less than one minute, and we're seeing liquid water come out the backside there. And I'm not using a pressure washer here, which of course would drive it even further. I'm just using a hose and giving it a washing on the outside. And you know, we were at 45, 50 seconds that we're seeing liquid water come out there. And so that liquid water, if we don't do a good job of putting a base wall flashing on this wall, is going to cause um, this bottom plate to get wet. This OSB is going to rot out within a pretty short time. Um, of course, you can see this, this OSB, we just, cut, we just hit this with a hammer. You can see how ragged it is. This does not take much water at all for this OSB to fall apart on us and really rot out. And uh, this is a pressure treated bottom plate, but just because it's pressure treated doesn't mean that uh, it's not going to draw termites because we've got liquid water in that space. Let me go on the outside and I'll show you what I was doing to hose this. And you can see this back side of the stone is getting soaked. And that was 45 seconds of wetting from a hose. So that really visibly demonstrates what a, uh, what a reservoir cladding is doing. And really, this is an incredibly porous uh, material. Let's talk for a second about whether we'd want to paint that or seal that. Somebody might say, hey, well, let's, let's stop this uh, action by sealing it. And in fact, that is an incredibly uh, bad way to solve the problem because that water will still get through with capillary action. Any break in that sealer, any uh, little bit of that uh, paint, if you painted it, that uh, would let water in, would now let, with capillary action, the same amount of water through there, but we're going to have less drying ability to the outside. And now we're really going to have major vapor drive issues because that 40 or 50 gallons that's going to store in this is not going to be able to, to uh, uh, dry to the front side. It's only going to be able to dry to the back side, and that's going to drive through into the house. Tyvek um, is a good uh, way to stop it, but Tyvek still is vapor porous. You know, a regular Tyvek home wrap, I believe, is around 50 or 60 perms, so it is permeable. Uh, commercial grade Tyvek, which I prefer to use, is, is closer to 10 perms, so there is a little bit of permeability, but really what we're trying to do is stop all that vapor drive at the front side of our sheathing or at this Tyvek layer. Um, and so when we're using reservoir claddings, we really need to pay attention to our waterproofing to our base flashings and, and making sure that not only are we taking care of bulk water but that vapor drive. Um, let me go in the let's go on the outside real quick and I'll just show you how I was hosing that and show you that it wasn't uh, 
that it wasn't a ridiculous amount of hosing. This is basically what I'm doing on the outside to get that to leak like that in 45 seconds. So think about, you know, if we had a pretty good rainstorm, any, any gutters that are missing, anything that's splashing back onto the house, and certainly sprinklers and irrigation systems. You know, I know at my house, some of my shrub beds will run for 20 minutes. You might be soaking this wall for 20 minutes. And that's how much water came through after 45 seconds. So please pay attention when you're using reservoir claddings. And uh, if you're remodeling, uh, see what you can do to try and correct these issues on your current house. Because um, there's a lot that can be done. But sometimes in this case, we just really need to take it all the way back and start fresh. That's really the right way to do it. Thanks for joining me, everybody. We'll see you next time.